Curious Lloyd. Evolution is a fickle matter. A little tweak here, and a bear becomes a DiCaprio mauling legend. A little tweak there, and it's a pile of bubblery embarrassment that's too stupid even to hump its way out of extinction. A little tweak here, and human beings get some bizarre genetic mutation that makes us more susceptible to cancer. A little tweak there, and we get borderline superpowers. So I shall now explain the following mutations. There's an adventure gene, and you might have it. What made Columbus seek the new world? What made Indiana Jones search for those crystal skulls, aside from George Lucas being out of ideas? Well, it may be genetics. Researchers have claimed that our urge to explore the world is at least partly rooted in a genetic mutation known as DRD47R, which is the Explorers or Adventures gene. In 1999, an extensive study by the University of California found this genetic mutation more common in Nordic migrant populations. A follow-up of the study looked at 18 indigenous populations living along the ancient African migrant routes and found that the DRD47R gene, along with its cousin 2R, is indeed more common in the people who have travelled the furthest from their ancestral homes. And you might have it too. The explorer's gene is thought to be in 20% of the population. The Danish are genetically predisposed to happiness. Denmark consistently ranks as the world's happiest nation. But why is that? Researchers from the University of Warwick finally isolated a genetic mutation in the Danish population which grants them almost superhuman proclivity for joy. This gene exists in both short and long versions, with the long version causing happiness by regulating increased reuptake of the feeling good chemical serotonin, and the shorter version causing neurosis and vague dissatisfaction. The Dutch and the Danes are the least likely populations to harbour the short gene individuals. It's not tied solely to location. Danish derived populations born elsewhere still retain their giddy genetics, but it also works inversely, since Denmark is the genetic epicenter of world happiness. That means that the further a country is from Denmark's genetic composition, the more likely it's to be a miserable place. Residents of an Argentinian town have developed a tolerance for poison. It's not easy living in San Antonio de los Cobres. The place is sitting 12,000 feet above sea level on dry volcanic rock. The environment is roughly as welcoming as Mars, except that they do at least have water. Water, which is poisonous. Yet somehow, people who inhabit this murderous Adin wasteland amble on, and they say, oh, our water's poisonous. So it was that the people of San Antonio de los Cobres set about evolving humanity's first known adaption to toxic chemicals, with at least 7,000 years of practice under their belt. They are now so accustomed to their new poisonous H2O that they can withstand its arsenic concentration, which is a ridiculous 20 times more than what who deems safe for human consumption. Asian people have evolved to smell better. The human body has two types of sweat glands. Eccrine glands are found all over the body and produce the sweat you're probably thinking of. Watery, salty, and relatively odorless. Apocrine glands excrete a thicker fluid, and the odor-producing bacteria it attracts is responsible for the weird smell you're starting to get real self-conscious about as you watch this video. But that is, unless you're ethnically Asian. East Asia and Korean populations have millennia old mutation that renders them relatively odorless. Their bodies are dotted with fewer apocrine glands and they benefit from a genetic variant which regulates the composition of sweat. As a result, their underarm secretions lack the tasty proteins and lipids that bacteria love to munch on, which goes a long way towards deleting their body odour. The gene variant responsible for the apocrine gland to drought is called ABCC11, and although there's a chance that the odd non-Asian person could have it, it's basically the genetic lottery. Only 2% of Europeans are estimated to have the get out of body odour jail for free gene. There's a flip side though, if a population produces less body odour, it also tends to be more sensitive to said odour. The Inuit are genetically protected against bad fats. If you're anything like me, your diet counts whiskey as a grain and cheese as a vegetable. And that's why we're all gonna die young and leave ugly waxy corpses, but if only we were Inuit. Now you see, thanks to the scarcity of edible flora, combined with the abundance of narwhal, the Inuit have historically enjoyed a diet composed of chiefly of blubbers. 
Yet they are seemingly immune to the unusual heart-stopping implications of an all-fat diet. With a food pyramid comprised of fatty marine animals and little else, the Inuit are surprisingly well protected from chronic ailments like heart disease. Researchers used to think that the omega-3 fatty acids heavily present in their diet gifted the Inuit an uncommon resistance to cardiac disease and diabetes. Also, fish oil purveyors have exploited to the tune of billions of pounds. To figure out the real reason Inuit's hearts don't just explode by the time they're 20, a Berkeley-led study analysed the genetic differences between 191 Inuit Greenlanders and 60 Europeans and 44 Han Chinese. Almost all of the Greenlanders, as opposed to just 2% of Europeans and 15% of Chinese, turned out to exhibit a genetic mutation that limits the body's own production of omega fats. This in itself might seem like a bad thing, because omega fats are good for you, but by lowering their production, the body also lowers the production of bad. Heart disease causing LDL cholesterol, because those processes are related. It's not all sunshine and rainbows though. The genes that control the fatty acid profiles are also implicated in height, so for their increased resistance to disease, the Inuit are an average of 0.8 inches shorter than the average person. But if you know what an average person is, please state it in the comments. Because, who is the average person? Evolution has sculpted humans into the world's greatest runners. Watching this video while slouched in your computer chair, or avoiding any type of work possible, you wouldn't necessarily guess that evolution has in fact horned your body into one of nature's most finely crafted running machines. Though we now mostly hunt gaming achievements and find deals at Costco, there once was a time when we could literally run animals to death during the hottest hours of the day. When it comes to long distance running, we easily outperform the begrudging silver and bronze medalists. The dog and the horse, neither of which come close to matching our endurance. We may lack animalistic power and speed, but our evolutionary timeline reveals that the range of two million year old adaptions lovingly transformed us into ultra efficient running hunters. Humanity Sir Mix-a-Lot approved our buttocks came about so we could keep our torsos upright better. We develop relatively narrow waists and swinging arm motions to counterbalance our wildly flaying legs. We even borrowed a page from the kangaroo playbook with springy Achilles tendons, which stores and releases mass amounts of energy. Last but not least, we lost our thick coats of hair to better allow body-wide sweating. But if you want to try running a marathon in a Bigfoot costume, you're more than welcome to see the outcome. And that's just our engine and bodywork. The brain provides the nitro with a number of chemical codes that makes us actually want to run. When our leptin levels get low, which is the hormone that makes you feel full, they turbocharge the body, inducing an urge to find food and to go as far as you can in order to do it. And then there's the famous runner's high, which shockingly isn't a load of crap. Running was such an important facet to our evolution that our brain rewards runners by releasing natural narcotics known as endocannabinoids. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and I'll catch you again next week.